If you want to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I hope part of your prayer life throughout the week includes some type of a fire being kindled within all those who are believers. Because we can look at the world and we can say that things need to change, but unless we as believers make that change, it will not happen. So we must, we must be praying for change in the world and that it to start within ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we titled this morning's sermon, The Purpose of the Thorn. Probably a familiar passage, you've heard uh, people speak about Paul and this thorn that was given to him. We want to look at that today. But in the title, The Purpose of the Thorn, I wanted to define what purpose actually is. Purpose is the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. The reason for which something is done or for which something exists. And we find throughout life there are reasons for things to be done. When I first started hanging around Jennifer before we were married and when we first started dating and started hanging around her family, I was informed pretty quickly that if you borrowed a pen or a pencil from her dad, then you had to make sure that you put it back. Now some of you might be familiar, he had this little duck that was cut out of like a tuba six and it was finished and, and in the back of the duck there was six holes and it had places that you could stick pens or pencils in. If you borrowed one of those, his expectation was that you put it back. The purpose of the duck was that you always knew where a pen or a pencil would be. You could go to the duck and you could find it. Now he got a little bit aggravated when things didn't get returned to the duck. So if you see Jennifer after church, just ask her how the duck was in their home when she was at home, and she'll probably have a story to tell you about that. But my understanding was it was somewhat of a discussion about how if you always put things back, and this duck served that purpose of the location to put it back, then you always knew where it was. In Paul's life, he speaks of a thorn that was given to him, and it served a purpose also. We're going to read that. If you'll stand with me, if you're able, we're going to read our text together. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 1. And again, keep in mind as we read this, there was a purpose for this thorn that was given to Paul. There are also purposes in our own life that God does specific things or works certain things within our life. So think about that as we read through. Verse 1 says, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now I want to stop there for a moment. Why is Paul saying I'm going to go on boasting? Because he was fighting against the Judaizers, those who were coming in with false teaching into the Corinthian church, and he, they were boasting about all that they'd done. And so Paul says, I'm going to go on boasting, but it's not about me. It's going to be about God. So that's why he makes that statement. Verse 2, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Where, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I ple pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong." Would you pray with me this morning? 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again today, Lord, thanking you for your word, the blessing that we have as you speak into our lives through it today. Lord, we're also thankful for your spirit, and we pray today, Lord, that we would be attentive to him as he ministers to our hearts. And Lord, that we would respond in the way that we should, in the way that you desire. And Lord, that your name be glorified through it. And Lord, that we would realize in our weaknesses that you see us through and that your name is glorified when we rest upon you. Lord, today again, we ask that if there be one here who does not know you as their personal Savior, that today they would make that choice and decision and they would call out to you. We thank you for your patience. Lord, we thank you for your grace in our life. Let us not take it for granted. We pray this in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And you may be seated. As we look at this passage of text, these 10 verses, I want to pull three points today. First off, the excitement of God's blessing. When you look at verses 1 through 4, you see Paul identifying this boasting, but you also see him talk about a great privilege and a great honor that he had, and that was when he was taken up into what is he notes as the third heaven. Now this is thought to be a reference to where God himself, li himself lives. When they say third heaven, you find that in text, what they're typically referring to is the first heaven is where birds fly around in. The second heaven is the universe, stars, moons, planets, all that. The third would be where God actually resides. So as Paul says, called up into the third heaven, he is expressing that he had an experience that he was blessed with, and it was in the presence of God. He also notes that that it was such a tremendous experience, and he, he heard things that he was not able to even repeat again. He was told, do not speak these words, do not say these things. Paul was blessed. Imagine the excitement that he would have had seeing and hearing, just experiencing all that he would have seen in the presence of God himself. Now, it's hard for us to imagine what that's going to be like. We haven't been there. We don't know anyone that's been there and come back to talk to us about it, but we just sang several songs about how we would like to be there, right? Because we know that it's a better place than where we are right now. We see that from the Word. Amen? Amen. We trust that God's Word is true, and so we trust that this place that Christ has went to prepare for us is much better than what we have right now. Imagine if you were Paul going there, seeing what he saw coming back to earth, the excitement that he would have. Now Paul was also a man that had come out of a Jewish religion, and he was extremely knowledgeable and very trained as a man of the law. He was respected in that way. Could have had a very prominent place in the Jewish culture. If you put the experience of this third heaven together with all the training that he had in the Jewish culture, he was an extremely, from many different areas, respected man, except when he became a Christian, those who respected him before actually turned their back on him. But he was still a very knowledgeable and a very blessed man. He understood that and he knew it. He also knew that if not careful, this stuff could go to his head. And he could become more inflating of himself than he was of God. With this resume, that human nature of ours sometimes takes over, and it would have been Paul possibly in our own life today or in the life of the church and a community, these things can begin to happen. We can begin counting our blessings we have, and if we're not cautious, we start comparing ourselves to others, and we take the glory off of God, and we begin to place it on ourselves. The experience of the blessing is something that we must, God's blessing is something that we must also look at in light of this is a gift God has given us. It's not of our ability, but it is a blessing in our life. If you have ever led someone to the Lord, if you've ever prayed with them as they have asked God to forgive them of their sins, they've repented that they were a sinner, and they've called upon Him to be their Savior, what a tremendous blessing that is if you've ever been able to be in the presence of that. 
But we also must remember that that has nothing to do with us. We are just a messenger in that moment in time, and it has everything to do with Jesus Christ. And so we must keep that in our mind. God allows us to experience that blessing, but it has nothing to do with us. Paul had that type of thing going on in his life here. When we look around and we see that as a church we have been blessed with wonderful facilities, a wonderful group of people that are from all different ages. If you look around the sanctuary right now, and if we were to walk back at where children's church and toddler church is, you would see people in all different age categories. What a tremendous blessing that is for the church. We sometimes take that for granted, but it is huge. God has blessed us with that. He has blessed us financially. We have seen salvations. We've seen people joining the church. I say all that not to brag. I say that to say God has blessed us in so many ways. We must remember to give Him the honor and the glory, or else we will become puffed up and we will be the individual that needs a thorn in our side. We must be cautious about that very thing. Sometimes, and God knows when this is needed, but sometimes we may need the disappointment of being humbled in our life in order for us to be the individual that God's called us to be. If you notice verses 7 through 9, Paul says in verse 7, So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the greatness of the revelations, I was given a thorn in the flesh. God knew what Paul needed in his life. This was not a comfortable experience for him, as we could uh, deduce from what we read in Scripture. Paul prayed three times that God would remove it from him, but God's answer was, my grace is sufficient. It wasn't comfortable. We don't know exactly what it was. Some believe it was poor eyesight. Some have went on to some type of temptation he may have had. We don't know what it was at all. But we know it was something that was placed there in order to keep him humble. He prayed, he appealed to the Lord, but the Lord did not remove it. Instead, the answer came back that my grace is sufficient for you. And then we sometimes leave off the last of that verse, but the last of that verse is really important for us to keep in mind. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. We remember that my grace is sufficient for you, but we forget that this is not about us. This is about God, and it is about His Son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, we must add the last part of that verse, for my strength, not Paul's, but God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. Not careful, we become dependent on our own abilities, our own resources. And instead of leaning upon God, we do things in our, on our own. God wanted Paul to understand that when obstacles would come, he needed to depend upon God. We might could look at this situation and say, you know, Paul was a tremendous leader in the New Testament church, we might say. Took the, the gospel to the Gentiles. He felt that was his major mission field. It wasn't his only, but his major mission field. We might could say, why would God not remove this obstacle from Paul's life? And then Paul could have given the glory to God for him removing it. But in the Lord's wisdom, he does not always remove problems. He does not always remove physical ailments. This was the case in Paul's life. He denied the request so that Paul would depend upon God's grace and mercy. God would receive glory every time that Paul ministered in spite of the thorn, whatever it might have been. I'm sure Paul would have been delighted for a period of time if God would have removed the thorn, but he was constantly humbled and he was constantly reminded for the rest of his life that he must depend upon God's grace. I'm sure there were times Paul was disappointed that God did not remove it. 
I'm sure Paul thought at times that things would be so much better if God would just take it away. Take me out of the situation that I'm in. Let's put it in our life today. Sometimes we pray that. Take me out of the situation I'm in. Life would be so much better if, if this wasn't a part of my life, if I wasn't in this area of my life. It would be so much better, God, if you would just remove that. But you see, what we think would be the best thing is not always the best thing. God has a sovereign plan, and we do not know why some would be healed and others still have the thorn. But we know that God is working all things together for good to those who love Him, to those who call upon His name. Paul understood that as well. God was providing the best thing for Paul and the best thing for the kingdom around Paul by leaving the thorn in his life. The thorn wasn't removed, but God gave grace so that the thorn worked for Paul instead of against him in his growth as a follower of Christ. takes us to the reality today of being a follower of Christ. Verse 10. Notice in the verse, Paul uses these words, for the sake of Christ. How hard is it sometimes for us to pray for the sake of Christ or develop our mindset around for the sake of Christ instead of for the sake of Kevin? Or for the sake of even, if we try to get biblical sometimes and we say, or even for the sake of the church. Or for the sake of my family. When in reality, we should be saying for the sake of Christ. You see, we let self get in the way. We let church get in the way sometimes. We let family get in the way sometimes. Instead of us bringing glory and honor to God, we want to leave it into ourselves. We don't do it intentionally. It's our fallen nature that sometimes comes out in those ways. But Paul says, for the sake of Christ, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. And then he says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. How is he strong? Because he has the power of God working in him in that point in time. When we try in our own ability to do things and to work through things, we are not strong no matter who we are, no matter what physical stature we have, no matter how many years we have been in a church, no matter how many verses we have committed to memory, no matter how many times we stop and pray, when we go at it on our own, we are not strong, but we are weak. And when we just realize our weakness and we turn to Christ and go in His strength, then we become strong. Paul was not strong in his own abilities. He was strong in Christ, working in him and through him. And we must learn to be content in all things and know that the spiritual life takes precedent over the physical life. How hard is that for us to grasp and to remember? The spiritual life takes precedent over the physical. We sit around, and, and I would ask you in your own prayer life to think about this whether it be tonight or whether it be even over lunch or whether it be in the morning, if you, if you pray in the morning, if you pray in the evening, whenever you pray, I would ask you to just think about what you're praying for. I would ask you to think about if someone were to come up to you and say, what is there that I could pray for you about in your life? What would your answer be? Many times we turn to the physical and many times our requests for others are the physical. I'm not saying that that's wrong for us to do. But what about the spiritual life? What about the individual that does not know Christ? What about the individual that, that has walked away from Christ? What about the individual that's struggling with whether they should believe or they should not believe? And all these people are around us every day, and are we praying for them? What about the individual that is dealing with a physical condition, but yet they're struggling in their spiritual life also? Are they at the top of our prayer list? And what about our own spiritual life? 
Do we ever pray for growth in our own walk with Christ? See, as a follower of Christ, God never promised a life free of affliction. But He did promise that His grace would see us through all things. Even though the thorns seemed to be a hindrance or a problem to Paul, the sin that this may have prevented from him committing would be much worse than any illness that Paul would be enduring. And I would say that in your own life today, in my life as well. Whatever thorn God may have placed in our life, if it prevents us from committing sin that God sees down the road that we would have committed, if it prevents us from doing that, if it humbles us to the point that our relationship with God is where it needs to be, or it has grown tremendously because of that, then maybe that's a thorn we need to keep around, and we need to embrace it. There was... Um, a woman that I knew um, several years ago, and she had a son that had, had went wayward. She had raised him in church, but, but he had turned his back on, when I say church, I actually mean God. He had turned his back on God. And she was praying for him. And she got to the point, because his life was so wayward, that she was praying that God would do whatever he needed to do to him in order for him to turn his life back. And she come to me after several months, and she said, you know, I think God has been working on me in this situation. And she said, I'm now praying that God will do whatever He has to do to me in order for Him to turn. Maybe that was the thorn she needed. I'm not saying that God wants people to walk away from Him. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that God used that moment in time to bring her into a spiritual growth that she had not been in before. Paul understood after God's answer of His grace was sufficient that he needed to embrace, and I want you to grab the terminology here, the blessing of the thorn. When we look at things in our life, and, and, and maybe we consider them thorns, maybe we haven't identified them as that so far, but we just know that there are issues in our life. Have we ever stopped and give thanks to God for what He has done, even if it's something that's negative in our life, because it may have just brought us through something that we wouldn't have been able to walk through without Him and us leaning upon Him, and that particular issue caused us to do that. Paul could have very easily said, because of this thorn, there's nothing I can do in the kingdom of God. Because of this thorn, I'm unable to do anything in ministry. Because of this thorn, I'm too weak or I'm not knowledgeable enough to do what is being asked of me. And therefore, I'm just going to have to sit back and do nothing. But that's not what Paul did. You know Paul. Responsible for over 60% of the New Testament that we have recorded for us. A man that started many different churches on missionary journeys. Paul didn't say, I've got this thorn, it's going to prevent me from doing stuff, so I'm just going to sit back. Paul said, God's grace is sufficient for me, I'm going to go do whatever God's called me to do. Have we went to that point in our walk with Christ today? You see, the reality of a follower of Christ is that it should never be about our abilities. But regardless of our inabilities or our physical illnesses, when we allow ourselves to be vessels that God can work through, then we allow God to be glorified instead of us. And we've got to get to the point where it's not about us. It is about Him. We were at church, uh, Chase and I were at church uh, Friday afternoon. And we were, I think we were standing in my office and we were, we were talking about something and all of a sudden we hear a loud boom outside or pop, whatever you want to call it. And the lights went out immediately. Well, the last time this happened, there was a car that had ran off the road and actually took out two power poles and electricity went out. 
So my first inclination is to get up and run to the window and look outside and see if somebody's hurt or, or had a wreck or whatever. And everything looks great outside. So finally we figured out that, that it was actually a transformer to the new part of the building, the green box that you drive by back here. It actually went haywire, if you want to call it that. And, and so um, we called Clay County to come out. They got it fixed that day, by the way, which very thankful for. But you've been in situations where you do not have electricity or have power. You walk into a room and without thinking, you turn the light switch on and nothing happens, right? That afternoon until they got it fixed, that was my afternoon. I, I would walk in my office and the lights were off and I'd reach over to flip the switch and the switch was already flipped because I'd done it already once before. <laughs> but you've been there, haven't you? You walk in the room, you flip it on, and, and nothing happens. In that immediate moment, you're somewhat surprised because you forget that the power is out. But then you realize, hey, the power is out. I feel like an idiot. Um, you see, occasionally, we need to be out of power in order to remember what a blessing we have. Some of you might remember the ice storm in 2009, I believe it was. Many homes, including ours, were out of power for many days. I think it was 17 for us. I know many of you have shared that you, you had multiple days out of power as well. What a blessing electricity was when it came back on, right? We didn't realize what God had given us until we went without it for a few days. Sometimes in our walk with Christ, we are given reminders of the blessing of grace that has been freely given to us. Sometimes in our walk with Christ, we need a reminder of the blessing of grace that has been given to us. Sometimes we're even given a thorn, maybe a permanent reminder of the power of God that it is made perfect in our weakness. I will say this, if that thorn comes into our life and we shut down, then we're not testifying to the power of the Almighty God but we're allowing Satan to win. Have we allowed something that's come into our life to shut us down? Because as we said before, that thorn may very well be the blessing from God. But we must respond in a way that would glorify Him. I don't know where you are in life, your relationship with Christ is between you and God, but at the same time, you impact and you influence many different people that you come in contact with. And God may have placed you in a specific place. We talked, those of you that are here on Wednesday morning, last Wednesday morning, we talked about that sometimes God puts us exactly where He wants us, even though it looks like a terrible situation. But yet that's exactly where God wants us because He is going to be glorified through that when we turn to Him. Maybe you're in a place in life where instead of pleading for the thorn to go away in your life, you need to embrace the thorn that God has blessed you with and realize that, that even through the thorn, you can glorify God by con continuing to serve Him in whatever way that He leads you to do that. Maybe you're in a point in time where you've just got a little bit of a splinter maybe in life, not a true thorn, right? There's a difference, right? If you've had a splinter before, you've been stuck by a thorn, you know there's a difference. Splinter's kind of aggravating. You can kind of dig that out. The thorn, though, it hurts. No matter which one it may be in your life, would you say that you're willing to serve God through it no matter what? Paul looks at the thorn and he says, you know, I prayed three times. There's nothing wrong. I mean, if Paul's doing it, I'm not saying Paul was a perfect man. Paul pleaded with God three times. You know, is it wrong for us to ask for the thorn to go away? Probably not. But at some point, we have to come to grips that if God's not taking it away, then that must mean it's the best thing for our life. 
Are you to that point where God's telling you this is the best for your life, just serve me through it? Because through my power, your weakness will become strength. would ask you this morning, would you trust Him in this way? We talk about trusting God with all of our life. We talk about that, you know, the only one in life, that, that people will let us down sometimes, but God will never let us down. If we truly believe that, if God will never let us down, we truly believe it, then can't we trust Him through the difficult situations as well? The thorns that come, the hardships that come no matter what they may be. I don't know where you are, but if God's been speaking to you about where you are, and maybe you've taken a step back because you just feel as though you can't do because of this in your life, maybe today's the day you need to realize that God has given you this as a blessing and you just need to serve Him through it. Would you trust this God the only God in this way. Would you trust Him in this way today as we stand together and we make ready for invitation? Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to You this morning thanking You for this time You've given us. And Lord, knowing that many times when we look at things in our life, we see them as hindrances, but You see them as the best thing for us. And so to God, today, God, no matter where we are, we pray that that if we're going through that time, if someone is going through that time today, well, we pray that they would see your hand at work and they could be at peace with what's going on in their life. Lord, help us to be mindful to glorify you in what we do. Lord, not to bring attention to ourselves. Lord, to rejoice in the, the blessings that you have given us but Lord, also to continue to point all of the blessing or all the glory, I should say, unto you and not to us. We thank you for what you've done. And maybe today we need to just stop. And, and Lord, if that's where we are in our life, that you just need us to stop and to glorify you for a minute for all you have done for us. And Lord, would you let that resonate in our life today? We pray these things in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen.